Today we're continuing and concluding our sermon series on the Sermon on the Mount, and I've just loved this chance we've had to dig deep into that sermon, Matthew 5 through 7, and try to listen like the Father told those first disciples to do to Jesus. It makes me think of our Wednesday night programming here and how much fun our kids had and many of us had. We had over 300 people here on Wednesday night uh, for our O for Fun. A lot of our kids come and many of you come and volunteer as our children are listening to God's word, listening to Jesus through our WANA program on Wednesday nights. But we took a little break from that just to have fun on Wednesday night, and it was a blast, and it was such a great outreach as many people, parents, grandparents, and others came through the doors. I just pray that God will continue to bless that mission he's given us, not just so that we can come, but that so more and more people can come and hear the word of God and, and respond to it, and not just so that they get to heaven, but so that they get the new life that Jesus is inviting us to live. And as we finish up on the Sermon on the Mount, I want to encourage you to be thinking about that for each of us. Because sometimes we fall into this thinking that the gospel is all about getting into heaven. I want to tell you that's not it. I mean, that's important. But heaven, Jesus tells us, is breaking in, coming near now to help us, to give us new life now. And not only do we not have to wait for heaven to start living that life, we can't really get there without starting to live that life now. we got to receive that new life and allow the Spirit to help us begin living it. Then we know that we're on the right path. So I want to invite you to be listening in this morning as Jesus calls us to that life. Lord, thank you for the privilege of serving you, of listening to you, of walking with you. Thank you that you speak to us and give us your spirit, not just so we can keep on living as we've always lived and do it in heaven, but that you grant us your word and your spirit in each other so that we can experience the joy of living that life now and into eternity. Help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Dallas Willard, this book we've been talking about through this sermon series, which I recommend to you called The Divine Conspiracy, talks about something called bumper theology, bumper sticker theology. When we take a phrase that has truth in it and kind of think that's the whole of the gospel. For instance, an example he uses is we often hear this and see bumper stickers that say Christians aren't perfect, just forgiven, which is kind of nice because it's true. <laughs> we're not perfect, and we thank God that we're forgiven. But if we think that's all there is to the gospel, then we're missing out almost completely on what Jesus is calling us, inviting us to do. We're not, the gospel is not just about being forgiven and getting into heaven. The gospel is about transforming our lives and witnessing through our lives to the truth of this gospel of transformation. It's far more than just having our sins forgiven. It's new life that Jesus offers us. Paul says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 where he says, if anyone is in Christ... He gets to heaven. No, he doesn't say that. He says, if anyone is in Christ, that person is a new creation. The old has passed away. The new has come. And so it's time, as we finish up the Sermon on the Mount, to hear Jesus saying, live this life. It's time for action here and now. So I invite you to hear the word of God. Matthew chapter 7, verses 12 through 29, as Jesus concludes his sermon. It goes like this. In everything, do to others as you would have them do to you. For this is the law and the prophets. Enter by the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the, the the way is easy that leads to destruction. And many will take it. 
For the way, for the gate is narrow and the road is hard that leads to life. And there are few who find it. Beware of false teachers who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You'll know them by their fruit. Are grapes gathered from thorns or figs from thistles? In the same way, the good tree bears good fruit, and the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will know them by their fruit. What comes next? It's worth waiting for. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. On that day, many will come and say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do deeds of power in your name, then I will say to them, I never knew you. Go away from me, you evil doers. Everyone then who, who hears these words of mine and acts on them is like the, the wise man who built his house on rock. The rain fell, the, the floods came the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it was founded on rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them is like the, the foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain fell, the floods came, and the winds beat and blew on that house. And it fell, and great was the fall of it. When Jesus had finished these sayings, the crowds were astounded, for he taught them as one having authority and not as their scribes. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Can you hear these words and not think that Jesus is talking about life right now here in this world? Can you hear these words and imagine even for a moment that all Jesus is concerned about is getting you into heaven? Everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into action is like the wise man who built his house on the rock. Enter by the narrow gate. Take action now. So what are these words of Jesus that we're supposed to put into action, to, to follow? We've been spending seven chapters on this, trying to think through what is it that God's calling us, Jesus is calling us to do. There's a lot in it. As we've talked about, many people think, well, it's just a bunch of disparate collection of sayings that are pulled together in these three chapters, but that's not the case. They build on each other. There's a weave to what goes on. Jesus is building a case, calling us to a life in which all of this begins to make sense for us and moves us on that path, that narrow gate, that road that's hard, but it's the road of life. And as I think about the, the weaving of Jesus' sayings in here, what I think about is how there, there are kind of these two movements in it. This movement of leaning into the grace of God, receiving the grace of God, trusting in the grace of God, and living out the grace of God, living out the love of God, putting what we're learning, what we're experiencing into action on behalf of others. It's this both and. It's like breathing in and breathing out. I don't know if you've ever tried to just breathe in and stop there. Anybody done that? doesn't work very well, does it? Like, yeah, God loves you. Receive that grace. 
But if you just try to hang on, if you just try to live there, if you just come here and you worship and you sing and you praise and you, and you don't whew, find ways to let that grace out, to share that grace, it's not life for you. You need both. And if you're all focused on breathing out, I don't know if you've ever tried to do that, just keep on breathing out. You can't do that forever either. you got to breathe in. This is the life that Jesus is calling us to. It's that both, the movement of both of those, that breathing in and that breathing out that we need to practice. You see just even through these chapters how that goes on, that ongoing movement right at the beginning. When Jesus sees the crowd, he goes up on the mountain, he sits down. And when he sits down, his disciples come to him, and he begins to speak. He begins to teach them. I, I think about that movement of the disciples coming to Jesus. And for us, every day, every moment, it begins right there. We've got to come to Jesus. And he starts right there, the first beatitude. Blessed are the poor in spirit. You know, those who have space in their heart and their spirit to receive what Jesus longs to offer us. That if we're full of ourselves, we're not going to be blessed And we get more full of ourselves and we're not going to be blessed. We must come to Jesus with open hearts, with the sense of poverty that understands how desperately we need the grace, the empowerment of God's spirit, the shaping of God's word. We come to Jesus to receive that. And the Sermon on the Mount begins right there. But then you might remember that it it turns a corner after the Beatitudes where he says, you know, you're the salt of the earth. You're the light of the world. Let your light so shine before others that they may see your good works, what you do with your life, and give glory to your Father in heaven. And then he goes on through chapter 5 talking about this doing that we're called to is not just about checking off the boxes. What do I got to do to get by with God to get into heaven You know, what's the law tell me? Jesus says, well, you know, it's told you you shouldn't murder. But I'm telling you, you got to love your enemy. Like Jesus is calling us, receiving this grace of God to do more than just fulfill the letter of the law, but to live out the spirit of the law, seeking to love one another and our neighbors and even those who are very difficult to love. God loves you. And sometimes, to be honest, You've got to know this. You're probably a little difficult to love. God loves you and calls us to love even those who are difficult to love. That's the movement. We come to chapter 6, and we find, again, it's mainly focused on this idea of connecting with God. He talks about prayer. He talks about fasting. He talks about almsgiving, these ways in which we can look good because we pray, because we fast, But if we're not doing it to connect meaningfully with God, it's worthless. That what we have to do is come to Jesus, lean into the grace of God, spend time in God's word, receive the grace of God as we pray. And then doing that, Jesus goes on in chapter 6 to say, so do not worry about what you will eat or what you will drink or about what you will wear. Don't worry Lean into the grace of God. Trust the grace of God. And then he turns the corner again. Do to others as you would have them do to you. It's this ongoing movement. And finally, you know, as he comes toward the end, he's saying, so listen to what I'm telling you, to the whole of what I'm telling you. Not to bumper sticker theology, but to this whole life that I'm calling you to live that is rooted, founded on the rock of who I am, of my teaching, of God's love for you, of this Father in heaven who loves to give good things to his children and lives that out through your actions. You know, I've been thinking about what, what Jesus says when he talks about beware of false teachers who come to you in sheep's clothing but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You'll know them by their fruit. You know, one of the things that we desperately need and we're looking for all the time is who can help us on that path of life? And there are a lot of teachers today. 
There always have been. Jesus wouldn't have said this if there weren't those people then. But right now, you can go on the internet and find teachers teaching all kinds of stuff. You can come to churches and hear teachers teaching all kinds of stuff. We need that teaching. We need that encouragement from one another. But how do we discern among all these voices which teachers, which examples to live out? And Jesus says the way you can do that is by looking at the fruit, the fruit of the teacher, the fruit of that way of life. Does the teacher, does the teaching that you're receiving, looking for, does it lead you to be more poor in spirit before God? Or does it lead you to be more puffed up? Does it lead you to be meek, trusting in the grace of God, doing the good God's calling you to do, knowing you can't fix everything and everybody, but you can do the good you're called to do, trusting God? Or is the teaching, is the teacher kind of calling you to get more full of yourself and more committed to fixing everybody, judging everybody, making sure it happens in your power and your strength? Are you getting more and more anxious because you need to have the power to make these things happen? Or are you looking to God, trusting God, listening to God, and just even doing the little bit, whatever it is, or the big bit, but that God calls you to do trusting in His power? One of the things about trees that... You know, and by the way, before I go on, just to say that this is one of the ways I can tell in myself, that I can evaluate in myself whether I'm listening well, whether I'm following that path. Is my life, is what I'm trying to do, is it that way of being poor in spirit, of being meek, or is it that way of trying to be puffed up and more powerful? Is my life or the life of those I'm listening to is it love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, self-control? Is it the fruit of the Spirit or is it the works of the flesh? Those are the kind of things Jesus calls us to pay attention to. We talked last week about not being judgmental, you know, in that sense of sitting in the seat of judgment and looking down on others. That kind of judgment is about separating us from each other. It's about looking down on others and making ourselves feel better. That's not what Jesus is talking about here. He's saying you've got to make judgments, observations that help you discern what you should be doing, what's the path you should be walking. So just to be thinking about that fruit. But finally, as I conclude, I want to talk about what trees do that bear good fruit. When the storms come, they dig the roots in deeper. They soak up as much nourishment as they can get so that through the storms, they can continue to bear fruit. They can continue to live. And for us, too, in the midst of the challenges we face here at church and I know in our lives, I want to encourage us to see the storms that come our way, the challenges. You know, those rains do fall. The floods do come. The winds do blow and beat against us, but we need not fear. These are opportunities for us to dig our, deeps, our roots in deeper, to make it all the more important to us that we're going to take in that nourishment, practice trust in God, and practice bearing good fruit in this season and in every season. This is why James says, count it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you meet various trials, for you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its full effect, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. And so I find myself in the face of the challenges in my life, as I see our church facing various challenges, don't be afraid. This is an opportunity for us to commit ourselves to leaning into the grace of God, I want to invite you to be practicing prayer all the more, asking, searching, knocking, leaning on the grace of God, and practicing bearing the good fruit of love, of kindness, of mercy, of peacemaking that God calls us to live out. This is our chance to seek together that narrow gate, and to help each other on that hard road that leads to life.
Let's pray together. Jesus, thank you that you came that we might have life and have it abundantly. We acknowledge that you never said it would be an easy life here on this earth. In fact, if anything, you said it's going to be a, a hard life. And yet a life in which there is an underlying joy that the world cannot take away. There is an underlying peace that our circumstances cannot disrupt. God, may we more than ever this day, this week, be founded on the rock on you and on your teaching of the grace of God and empowered by your spirit, Lord, may we bear good fruit in season and out of season to the glory of your name. And all God's people said,